Welcome to the European Revolutionary Report. I'm Jacqueline Sturt. Thank you for joining us. Today is Wednesday, May 29th, 1881. I'm Jenna Sturt. We have a very special broadcast today on the European Revolutionary Report. It is called You Decide. The goal of today's broadcast, You Decide, is to provide our viewers throughout Europe with the information to decide if their country is ready for a revolution. We have an incredible lineup of distinguished guests to help you answer that critical question. We will look at the revolutionary events that have occurred throughout Europe over the last 50 years. We will examine different viewpoints to help you make an informed decision. So let's get right to it. Earlier, I had the honor of interviewing Mr. Lamartine on the streets of Paris. Mr. Lamartine is one of France's leading poets and was the temporary leader of France following the Revolution of 1848. Welcome, Mr. Lamartine of France. In order to put things into perspective for our viewers, let's recap the political and social landscape of Europe that led up to the Revolution of 1848 in France. Well, following the French Revolution, there was considerable debate throughout Europe about the role of government. Of course, conservatives, wealthy property owners, and nobility wanted to preserve the traditional monarchies of Europe. The liberals, mostly middle class business leaders and merchants, wanted to give more power to elected parliaments. However, only the educated landowners would be able to vote in such parliaments. The radicals, like myself, wanted drastic changes. They believed in democracy for the people as a whole. How do you explain why the lines that separate these political theories became blurred? A new movement of nationalism emerged. Nationalism is the belief that one's greatest loyalty should not be to a king or an empire, but to the nation of a people who share a common culture and history. When a nation also had its own independent government, it became a nation state. One of the key concepts of the French Revolution was the quality of all French people. This idea fostered a tremendous sense of pride. During the time frame we are reviewing, the first people to win self-rule were the Greeks. For centuries, Greece was part of the Ottoman Empire, which controlled the Balkans. The Balkans is the region of southeastern Europe now occupied by Greece, Albania, Bulgaria, Romania, and the European part of Turkey, and the former republics of Yugoslavia. What influence did nationalism have on this revolt? Nationalism was a driving force of this successful uprising. For centuries, the Greeks kept alive the memory of their ancient history and culture. The nationalist spirit motivated Greek people to propel Greece to become a nation state in Europe. Eventually, the powerful nations of Europe supported the Greeks' quest for independence and defeated the Ottomans. Let's turn now to other regions in Europe. What was happening across Europe in 1830? In 1830, Europe was swept by revolutionary enthusiasm. The return to old order that was carefully arranged by the Congress of Vienna was falling apart. Liberals and nationalists were rebelling against conservative governments. In 1830, Belgians, de Belgians declared their independence from Dutch control. In Italy, nationalists worked to unite the many separate states on the Italian peninsula. Eventually, Austrian troops restored order in Italy. In 1830, Poles living under Russian rebelled in Warsaw. It took one year for the Russians to crush the Polish uprising. Together, these events are known as the Revolutions of 1830. By the mid-1830s, old order seemed to have re-established itself. What went wrong with the Revolutions of 1830? What should the rebels have done to achieve their goals? Well, first let's define those goals. Many of the struggles in 1830 were led by the liberal middle class, okay. teacher, lawyer, and businessmen. They were rebelling to achieve a constitutional government and the formation of nation states. However, they lacked military experience and organization. They were simply unable to stand up to the powerful forces of the conservative governments. However, the resource order was only temporary. The political instability led to another wave of uprisings in 1848. Let's talk about the revolutions of 1848 in Europe. Once again, these rebellions for the most part were unsuccessful. What went wrong? 
The revolutions of 1848 were ethnic uprisings. Nationalism, nationalism was a dominant force. In Budapest, there was a call for parliament and self-government in Hungary. In Prague, Czech liberals demanded Bohemia independence. In Vienna, an angry mob clashed with the police. Metternich was forced to resign, which set off liberal revolts throughout the German states. However, the revolutionaries failed to unite themselves, order nation, and conservatives gained control once again. How was the French Revolt in 1848 different from other rebellions in other countries in Europe? The radicals in France, like myself, demanded democratic government as the main goal of revolution. A Paris mob overthrew the monarchy of Louis Philippe and established a republic. I led the temporary government. Why did the new Republican government fall apart almost immediately? What could have been done to prevent this? Unfortunately, the radicals in France split into two factions. One faction, led by myself, only wanted political reform, which we achieved. The other faction, led by Louis Blanc, also wanted social and economic reform. Our differences led to violence in the streets of Paris. I believe that my radical adversaries attempted to thrust too much change onto the people of France. Instead of turning to violence, we should have discussed our different approaches. Thank you, Mr. Lamartine, for providing such valuable insights to our viewers. Next up on this special broadcast of the European Revolutionary Report called You Decide is an intriguing interview with Louis Napoleon outside of his Paris mansion. But first, we must take a commercial break. More than just a pretty brawly, this pretty parasol will make you jolly. Every young girl and each young lady needs a lovely parasol to keep her shady. With fine lace details and stunning decor, oh, this parasol does so much more. Then just block the sun's sweltering rays is a fashion statement that will evoke praise. This beautiful parasol can be yours for the low price of five French francs, sold by fine merchants throughout Europe. Welcome back. Now we will go to our interview with Louis Napoleon outside his Paris mansion. Welcome, Mr. Louis Napoleon Bonaparte. Please share with our guests how he came to power in France. Let me start with the reign of Louis Philippe. In 1830, Louis Philippe became king and supported liberal reforms in France. However, in 1848, as revolution swept through Europe, an angry Paris mob overthrew Louis Philippe and your previous guest, Mr. Mr. Lamartine, became the temporary leader of France. I won the presidential election in 1848. What was the effect of the violence among the radicals in France in 1848? It was that very violence that led to my being elected president. The violence that erupted among different radical groups turned the French people away from the radicals. A moderate constitution was created that called for an elected president. Why did you decide to take the title Emperor Napoleon III? I am a conservative. The most effective way to implement my policies that benefited France was to do so as an absolute rule. Are you surprised that the large majority of French people accepted your decision to call yourself emperor? No, not at all. The French people were tired of political instability that had plagued France for many years. The French people viewed me as a strong and effective leader that would bring peace to France, and they were very right. You mentioned that your policies benefited France. What did the French people gain as a result of your policies? As emperor, I built railroads, encouraged industrialization, and promoted public works. I stabilized the French economy. Over time, unemployment in France decreased. I restored France to prosperity. Do you have any concerns that your role as emperor caused the French people to lose freedoms that they had fought so hard to win? No, it is true that France's return to governance under an absolute ruler diminished some of the freedoms of the French people. But France was better off under my rule. Look at everything I have accomplished. The French people willingly accepted that trade-off. I restored peace and prosperity to France. So what if a few freedoms were lost as a result? Thank you, Mr. Louis Napoleon, for sharing your vision with our viewers. 
final interview on this special broadcast of the European Revolutionary Report called You Decide is with Tsar Alexander II of Russia. Welcome Tsar Alexander II, the current ruler of Russia. How would you describe yourself, Tsar Alexander II? Although I am a czar, I consider myself to be a liberal because I have instituted several liberal reforms in Russia. What do you consider your most significant reform and how did it impact the people of Russia? The first and boldest of my reforms occurred in 1861. I issued the Edict of Emancipation which freed 20 million serfs. Under my reform, peasant communities received about half the farmland in Russia. The nobles kept the other half. The government paid the nobles for the land. Each peasant community had 49 years to pay the government for the land. Why didn't you just abolish serfdom outright? Why did the peasants have to buy the land from the government? Well, my plan accommodated both the nobles and the serfs. The government could not just take the land from the nobles and give it to the peasants. So the government purchased the land from the nobles and basically sold it to the peasants. Feudalism existed in Russia for, ma for centuries. What motivated you to free the serfs? Many Russians, including myself, believe that serfdom was morally wrong. Furthermore, the feudal system had prevented Russia from advancing economically. Please elaborate and defend your position that the feudal system caused Russia to stall economically. In the early 1800s, Russia had not entered the modern industrialized world. Russia still practiced a feudal system whereby serfs were bound to the nobles on whose land they worked. The lack of modernization became painfully apparent when my father, Tsar Nicholas I, lost the Crimean War. Russian industries and transportation systems were unable to supply adequate supplies to the troops. It was clear to Russia and to the world that Russia needed to enter the modern industrial world. Tsar Alexander II, do you ever worry that your reforms are too aggressive and may spur terrorism in Russia? I am well aware of the risks associated with the significant social and political changes that accompany freeing the serfs. The risks are outweighed by the positive impacts of my reforms on the serfs. Thank you, Tsar Alexander II, for this informative interview. That interview with Tsar Alexander II was taped just days before Tsar Alexander II was assassinated. His successor, Alexander III, a conservative, has already tightened Tsar's control in Russia, although he says he is committed to industrial development. I hope that you have found a special edition of European Revolutionary Report informative and enlightening. Is your country ready for a revolution? You decide!